Thank you. I'm uh, really honored to be here. Uh, I've worked for the past several years, about the past 15 years, with a, a pretty large wind energy project near Ellensburg, uh, which is where I'm from. And uh, we've had some positive results from that in, from several different angles that we'll, that we'll talk about here. I think one of the difficulties in this is that green is sort of in the eye of the beholder, and I'm not quite sure uh, what everybody might want to know. So I'm going to take a run at a few things that I think might be useful for you to hear about, but then we'll stop and uh, just have people ask some questions. Uh, you know, we used to say that hydropower was green energy because it didn't burn fossil fuels. Uh, but at least in Washington state, uh, they do not consider hydropower to be green energy anymore because it's a little difficult for salmon to get past the dams. Uh, so we actually, uh, we actually sell our hydropower to California where they still consider it green energy in order to meet California's quota for green power. And, and then we're generating a fair bit of, of wind power at this point. And there's some pros and cons to that that we'll talk about. I guess I, I've been encouraged by some social scientists to uh, reveal some of my presuppositions before I start talking about things that I think are facts, because these really do affect how we interpret facts. And, uh, you know, one of my convictions is that rangeland-based livestock production is a, a, a good thing to do for a society, there are um, there's a an old Alabama song that says these are the people where the fruits of their labor are worth more than their pay, and uh, we don't last long as a civilization if we don't have that kind of true wealth. Uh, we've for one thing we have to eat, and we begin to see some pretty serious problems when our dependency on imports starts to get interrupted by uh, poor relationships with other countries. Another conviction is that. You know, once once rangeland or pasture turns into a subdivision, it doesn't usually go back. Uh, that's a, a unless things just collapse and the neighborhood falls apart, and you know we uh, nature will take back over. But we're not going to see that in our lifetimes. So I feel pretty convinced that. Uh, you could you could prove that financially viable ranching is important for natural resources conservation. And sort of the other side of that coin is the conviction that uh, what's good for rangeland health tends to be good for ranch financial health. And we'll make some of those connections. I feel like we have some obligation to pursue this and to try to do it well. And I think we're actually making some pretty big strides in that. Uh, Nathan Sayre, who's actually a geographer from UC Berkeley, which seems like an unlikely place to get some good advice about rangeland grazing, uh, wrote a book a couple of years ago titled Politics of Scale, A History of Rangeland Science, and it's a tremendously good read. I highly recommend everybody getting a copy and reading it, but he, he offered up this sort of cynical socioeconomic definition of rangelands, which is almost a return to what the textbooks used to say, you know, the was it 1955, Stoddard, Smith, and Box said that rangelands were everything that was left over after you excluded forests, cropland, urban areas, uh, you know, everything that was left over we could call rangelands. And uh, we've moved more toward a positive definition of describing rangelands as places where the plant community is dominated by grasses and shrubs mostly. Uh, but I'm not so sure that this is an accurate way of characterizing rangelands that they tend to be places where there hasn't been some other, um, you know, more lucrative economic use uh, that, that has taken root. Uh, but I, I think, again, this is pretty important and it's a good story to tell that I don't think we've done a good job telling. Uh, so partly I want to encourage you to tell this story. Rangelands based livestock production is the only sector of food and fiber production that doesn't rely on obliterating whatever was there before. You know, we don't, you don't grow a cornfield without removing whatever was there before the cornfield. And if we do this right, you know, we can produce a full suite of ecosystem goods and services in the same space that we're producing pounds of beef and all the other things that we get from livestock. Uh, and that's, that's really unique. And it's something that we should value. And uh, there's a lot of efforts right now to find other ways to monetize those ecosystem goods and services so that there's some payment back to the people that are, uh, you know, that have the economic risk uh, 
of holding large quantities of land. Everybody knows that ranchers are land rich and cash poor, and it can make it difficult to hang on to open spaces like this. Uh, I bring up this photograph because this was on a, this is actually on the Richards Ranch over in the Owyhees. Uh, a group of us at WSU got some funding from the Climate Hubs to do some short film documentaries on ranches in Oregon, Idaho, and Washington that were managing for what we called rangeland resilience. And uh, one of the angles of that was social resiliency and working with neighbors and land agencies uh, around fire. And so we spent a couple days on the research ranch with a small two-person film crew. And uh, one of the videographers who grew up in the Tri-Cities in Washington State, grew up in, in the city, was sitting in this spot with a video camera set up. This is a still shot from a video uh, clip. And he'd been sitting there for a little while, you know, waiting for this group of cowboys to bring this little batch of cows over the hill. And when we got back together at the end of the day, he said, that was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life. He was extremely moved by this. And I think Dostoevsky said that beauty will save the world. And he might have been more right than he realized. Uh, Jerry Holacek, who's a colorful range scientist from New Mexico State, said that rangeland-based livestock production done well is probably a matter of national security. We need to be able to grow food in ways that result in soil building and not soil loss. And I think this is a good story that we need to keep telling. Now, before I forget about it, uh, I've been running this Art of Range podcast for about the past four years, and it's really been a lot of fun. Uh, and I think you'll find something there that's useful. We're almost up to episode 100 uh, now. There's a release every two weeks. Uh, they're nearly hour-long interviews with people on everything under the sun, from uh, a hundred-year-old man in Ellensburg who grew up in eastern Montana and remembers eating sage grouse after a baseball game, you know, barefoot. And uh, Stan Beaver is talking about key performance indicators in ranch financial analysis and cheatgrass control, fire management, grazing philosophy, everything under the sun. So if you haven't yet, uh, take a listen. Take one of the bookmarks on your table, and I've got some stickers, if you like that, better over by my hat on the table there. And if you have some suggestions for somebody you think would be a good interview, uh, shoot me an email or grab my card and give me a call. Well, we uh, one, of the, one of the case study videos that we produced was on this wind farm grazing project east of Ellensburg uh, with the Stingley Ranch. And uh, the, the angle on that one was 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 pushing ecological health. And I think that has paid them back in several ways, uh, not the least of which is calves that they say home have almost no pharmaceutical costs uh, compared to the ones that are raised on, you know, say a three species irrigated pasture down the valley. So before we talk more about the pros and cons of wind energy, I'm gonna see if I can make this video come up because it's worth watching. And I'll see if I can get this shared with the people that are online. So that's loaded. It's not playing yet. Let's see. I'm not sure it was sharing. Oh, there it is. Stop sharing. And now I go back to share. And share. Eventually. I don't think it did it, but it's it flopped back. It's got it in. There it is. Okay. I'll go to here. All right, let's see if it works. That's audible out there. Russ Stingley runs a cow-calf operation in Kittitas, Washington, on rangeland that is under checkerboard ownership, including parcels owned by Puget Sound Energy, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, and the Washington Department of Natural Resources. Well, our operation kind of consists of me and my boys, my daughter. We, we all, between all of us, 
we run about 850 cows and uh, um, the range ground consists of about 25,000 acres. We have some ownership of our own, but uh, most of it's lease ground that uh, spread out over the Kitas Valley. Stingley manages grazing under a Coordinated Resource Management, or CRM, plan, which was developed by consensus among a voluntary coalition that includes the Stingley family, the landowners, and other local stakeholders, diverse partners who did not originally have a history of working collaboratively. Together, partners plan for multiple goals, including cattle production, wildlife habitat, and wildfire risk reduction. We're here to generate renewable energy. We're the experts in the electrical field, but when it comes to managing the landscape, we really need those partnerships to help us manage going forward. Early on in the development process of the wind farm, we understood that traditional uses of the land was really important to the local community, and we wanted to make sure we committed to continuing with those traditional land uses and partner with um, the locals on implementing a, a more sustainable grazing plan throughout the facility that balanced the needs of both the, the grazing and wildlife and wildlife habitat. Based on the terms of the Coordinated Resource Management Plan, the Stingleys have a lower stocking rate than is usual for ranchers in their area. Stingley is managing with short grazing periods, low impact on plants and soil, and high post-grazing residual. Together, these strategies have supported high plant biodiversity and good animal health. We backed the numbers off almost half when we took it over and uh, to try to improve it some, which did help. Describe the balancing act between like what's good for the ground and what's good for the cow. We're always worried about the cow, but you know, it is, you can't just uh, take everything from the ground either because, I mean, you need this again next year. It's not ideal for the cow, but she's doing fine. You know, she still looks good. Um, we'll leave a little bit for the, the grass and hopefully, you know, kind of put some in the bank for next year. We had uh, the CRM state tour out here, you know, and we went to a spring to the north here and one of the guys asked, uh, uh, when will you graze this pasture? And I said, well, we just moved cows out three days before that, you know. So uh, it's obvious it's not overgrazed when you have those kind of comments, you know. The Stingleys have also improved distribution of cattle across the landscape by installing fencing and redeveloping water points with cost share from Puget Sound Energy and by strategically locating salt, supplemental protein, and hauled water. You know, we, we put in a lot of fence, which improved the ground as far as being able to utilize it better. By having more pastures, your rotation works better. The pines used to be one pasture. That pasture is actually three pastures now, so you can go early three times, you know, which you're back in the original rotation, where when it was one pasture, you only got to use that range ground uh, early spring once out of three years. I think there's 26 springs we've redeveloped because uh, if your water's all in one place, that's where the cattle tend to be. So we've tried to develop as many springs and, as possible out here to spread cattle out, you know. And by using salt and we haul water, moving water tanks to the outlying areas to pull cattle away from the other troughs helps a lot in this, this country out here. Grazing under a coordinated resource management plan is not without its challenges, including having to move cattle between pastures in a more complex pattern than previously. Overall, this leads to higher production costs, though manageable enough that the Stingleys can still run a profitable business. You know, uh, like from here to Whiskey Gym, we're looking at two miles, but we've had to go from here down to park. Uh, so it's probably eight miles that way, you know, and sometimes it's not the, where they want to go. And, the, and then another uh, drawback when you jump pastures like that, uh, you know, if you're just moving from one pasture next, you can push cows through and leave the gate open. And if the cow don't have its calf, she'll go back and get it that night or the calf will follow. So they stay paired up 
where we jump now, like if we leave Whiskey Jim and come over here, uh, sometimes we'll orphan calves, you know, even though we, we try to go back and find them and that. Managing under the Coordinated Resource Management Plan has improved the condition and resilience of the vegetation. The Stingleys were able to maintain stocking rates even during a statewide drought in 2015 with a combination of healthy grass stands, supplemental protein, and providing water. Meanwhile, the Coordinated Management Plan has also led to documented habitat improvements. And despite the logistical challenges, the Stingleys feel like the Coordinated Resource Management Plan has given them access to land that they wouldn't otherwise be able to graze so that they can maintain a way of life that they are passionate about. Without it, uh, you, the enjoyment part, I mean, that's kind of a way of life that we love doing out here. So, uh, you know, you, you take away the candy, sometimes the uh, other part's not that good, you know. We have an abundance of wildlife species throughout the facility. We have Rocky Mountain elk, we have mule deer, we have reptiles, we have bear and cougar, and we have an abundance of bird life, including sage grouse. We have public access, recreation, grazing, hunting, um, and so having that balance was really important to PSE, and we believe we've achieved that balance. You know, there was, there is some headaches involved in this, but you don't have to concede that much to gain a whole bunch. Everybody basically has the same goal on a different, you know, how they go about it. And I think these agencies are gonna like um, see that it's working out here, you know, and like the wildlife's doing good, the birds are doing good, you know, the grass is doing good and they're getting their objectives met. So I think it'll hopefully, you know, in the next five, 10 years, a lot of this uh, opens up other ground for other people even. <laughs> Figure out how to get back out of it. Stop share. And just go back to share. All right, we made it. Uh, if you're interested in the other two case studies, uh, the easiest way is to go to that website, uh, the CSANR. Uh, if you just Google search CSANR case studies, I think it'll get you there. Yeah, there there are some bears out there. I was doing some monitoring work and was had just gotten to the end of a transect line and stood back up to straighten my back out and turned around. And here's this cinnamon-colored black bear, uh, not from me, me to that wall. And he was standing up on both his hind legs uh, just looking at me. And it took me a few seconds to figure out what it was because I've, I've seen some bears at a distance there, but i uh, never up close standing up had that beautiful white patch on his chest. Uh, and just about the time I got a camera up to take a shot, he was you know, turning around to go back down on all fours. He walked away and I saw him for about you know, five seconds and then he stopped and I continued working and I never saw him again after that. The sagebrush isn't that tall. So I'm not quite sure where he was hiding, but uh, there is a pretty healthy population of black bears out here, uh, along with quite a bit of other kinds of wildlife. Well, we wanted to, the question of, you know, for the talk was what are some challenges and opportunities integrating grazing with wind energy? Uh, and we'll blow through a couple of those here and then uh, take some questions and then talk about grazing for fire control, which I think is one of the main things uh, you guys have to offer some of these properties. You know, that if in this case, uh, this project is mostly on land owned by the power company, and that's quite a bit different situation than what I understand is is more commonly the case. Even in Washington state, there's not too many other uh, wind facilities where they own most of the land. It's usually leasing from public land owners, uh, state land, federal land, or on private land. Uh, so this more common scenario where a private land owner is leasing a footprint leasing space uh, to a wind turbine, you know, the most obvious benefit is that there's some revenue from that, uh, which can be pretty useful without a, a really large footprint. Uh, particularly compared to solar facilities, uh, the wind, this wind energy seems to work pretty well. You know, some of these things are complementary. For example, uh, the, the electrical engineers say that 
wind energy is not very useful unless it's paired up with what they call base power, meaning the wind could stop at any moment. And they tend to site these facilities where you have steady wind, not necessarily fast wind, but still wind is somewhat unpredictable. And uh, when it starts to slow down, you've got to be prepared to, you know, backfill the grid with something else like hydropower or, uh, you know, uh, some other form of uh, more stable energy production. Uh, but there, they, PSE has experimented with a small solar generation facility, and they've got a five acre, I think that's right, a five acre solar array, and it only produces half a megawatt of power. Uh, one of these turbines produces 2.2 megawatts of power, you know, when the footprint on the ground isn't but you know, 50 feet across the pad. Uh, and depending on where they're at, you know, they may or may not be a major eyesore. So whether or not it's green is somewhat in the eye of the beholder. I think in most cases where there's a wind energy facility, they're usually paying for road maintenance and that can be useful if you've got, you know, a power company that's paying for gravel and graders on a, on a ranch road, uh, that can be pretty helpful. At least in our case, as they mentioned, there was the, the the power company was paying for some grazing infrastructure. This was an area that's been grazed for a, a long, long time, but a lot of the water, uh, a lot of the seeps that had been developed into watering tanks had been in disrepair. And so uh, PSC put up the money to replace some of that infrastructure and then <laughs> traded labor. The rancher did the work to install these water developments and they traded that for grazing fees. So they were essentially not paying anything uh, per AUM for grass here, but they're uh, they're offsetting that with their labor to repair fence and uh, put in water developments and provide fire control. Uh, there's also some potential for you know, various kinds of land management funding, particularly weed control. Uh, the road network is clearly one of the bigger risks um, and that provides a, a vector for weeds. Uh, if the power company owns the land, you know, there's a potential here to have access to a pretty large grazing area. And depending on who owned the land previously, uh, in Washington state, you know, some of the public landowners uh, are not ordinarily very friendly to grazing. And so uh, the, the power company may open those grazing lands back up where they might have been closed for some time. Uh, and this, this one's about 25,000 acres. And so that's been a, a pretty pretty large benefit to the rancher. You know, road infrastructure is a double-edged sword. The road network is one of the main problems, but it, you know, depending on uh, how roadless it was previously, having a few roads around can be useful, you know, to get around and do stuff. And they also function as a fire break. Uh, in this case, where the power company owns the land, it's really treated like public land, but, but with uh, some decision-making flexibility that's more like private land. Uh, in 15 years of working with PSE, uh, this is, I don't think I had any graphics that showed land ownership, but uh, the power company owns about 16 sections and the lands around it are mostly owned by Department of Fish and Wildlife and our DNR, which is state trust land. Uh, and it has been really eye-opening to see the difference in red tape requirements to do anything on even state land, much less federal land. Whereas with PSE, even though they're a power company and they've got some regulations through our energy facilities siting something commission. Uh, still, you know, if you get to one or two people, the two of you can make a decision and then you go do it. It doesn't require an act of Congress or a proclamation from the governor uh, to do anything. And they, PSC has been, uh, has been pretty vocal about their perceptions about the benefit they receive from grazing for fire risk reduction. And we'll talk about some of the details of that in a minute. You know, the obvious risks, the biggest one I think is the, the road network, uh, and just in terms of between the traffic and roads in places where they weren't, that tends to be where you have weeds come in, especially stuff like cheatgrass. Uh, and it results in some fragmentation. You know, the roads occupy a lot more space than the turbine pads do. And so the roads are definitely the big deal and, and not the turbine pads. Interestingly, cows and elk really like to loaf on the turbine pads. You'll see them lined up in the shade, you know, of or wherever the turbine uh, shadow happens to be sitting, there'll be cows piled up on the turbine pads because it's some of the only flat ground around. And of course there's, you know, if there's any uh, pasture gates, you know, on these, the, the turbine maintenance 
uh, even though this facility has uh, about 165 turbines, you know, there's there are vehicles, service vehicles going down pretty much every road every day. And so it can be difficult to keep cows in without automatic gates because sometimes the turbine technicians get tired of get out, open the gate, drive through, get out, shut the gate, and gates just don't get shut. And of course, the increase of roads and traffic results in uh, definitely an increased fire risk. Uh, what you know, one of the unknowns had been what the turbine effects would be on the bird population uh, in the eastern United States. That has been a, a pretty large problem where you get a lot of mortality of both songbirds and uh, things like bats. Uh, we haven't had that. They're required by at least state regulations to uh, do bird mortality surveys, and now they've got drones that are trained to look for dead birds. And they don't have a lot of dead birds. I think part of the reason for that is that the bird's activity tends to be right above the sagebrush canopy level, you know, which is not usually more than about head high. And uh, when the turbine blades at the bottom of a stroke, it's still about 130 feet up in the air. And so there's a pretty large uh, zone of air that doesn't have any turbine spinning. And so they have not seen uh, very much bird mortality from the turbines uh, on this particular project. And I think that's consistent with some of the other ones, at least on rangeland. You know, one of the risks of the power company owning the facility or owning the land is that they may have their own, uh, you know, impositions on when you can and cannot graze. In this case, you know, they mostly let us determine that, but it's done in conjunction with them. So if they've got a road paving project, you know, we don't graze that pasture when they've got um, road construction going on. In some cases, they may want to charge grazing fees, but uh, our experience has been that they're typically willing to waive that for the benefits that they feel they're getting from having a grazer out there. And that's been a pretty major benefit to the rancher because there is additional labor involved in managing livestock in this in this landscape compared to not having a wind farm there. Uh, one of the things that has thrown a monkey wrench in a couple projects is that they have to get an archaeological survey anytime you put a fence post in, put a water tank in, you know, redig a cattle guard hole, uh, and sometimes that slows things down quite a bit. Well, I'm not quite sure what questions people might have about integrating livestock and wind power. Uh, those are some of the pros and cons. So I'm going to stop there and we'll take some questions and then we'll continue from here. Oh, this is my water cooler. <laughs> yeah. You, you mentioned effects on wildlife as a consequence of a physical, like the, the, the blades hit them. Are there other factors that might affect wildlife. I, I'm familiar with turbines that get struck by lightning and uh, blades are then no longer hmm. of the same pitch and so they emit a sound uh, that I, I don't know anything about anything yeah. there, but is that... No, it's a good question. I'm not sure. I, I know at least on uh, the, some of the effects on humans have been tied to shadow flicker in people that live like in the shadow of a turbine. Uh, these aren't anywhere near people or any you know residential uh, housing. So I don't know about the effects on wildlife. In the wintertime, sometimes they do accumulate fog that where there's an ice buildup and then it gets heavy enough that it'll throw it. Uh, you know, they, the, the rotation velocity is regulated by FSEC. And so these don't turn faster than about 15 revolutions per minute. Uh, but still, if you've got, you know, if the radius is 140, 150 feet, the tip of that thing is still spinning at 150 miles an hour. And so even though they, you know, they don't look like it's a fan, still uh, there's some danger with throwing ice. I'm not aware of that ever having an effect on animals. But uh, one of the things that they've had to do is, is uh, relocate some of those hedgehog cactuses that were in the way. But, you know, I'm not aware of any effects on vegetation aside from you know having roads mostly sitting on these bald knobs where you have kind of a unique species assemblage uh, yeah i'm not sure about other uh, other effects we certainly have not been aware of any here yeah 
How do they tie all this into the grid? Is that underground lines or? Yeah, the lines are all underground. Yeah, there's yeah, a couple of substations. Uh, there are a couple of substations, but all of the all of the transmission lines have been underground. They buried them about ten feet down, uh, and then there was a you know planted that back. They do generate some heat, but uh, I don't think that heat is making it all the way to the surface. They had pretty good luck with planting a native plant there, so the weeds don't grow in all those trenches. Yeah. Yeah, the trenches were pretty successfully rehabbed where they attempted to put the topsoil back on the top after they you know, put the trench back together. And that was pretty effective and they replanted it. Uh, and the planting took quite well and had a fair bit of volunteer sagebrush and other stuff to where uh, it, it looks different, but it's definitely site adapted native species that have taken in there. Uh, the bigger problem with weeds has been on the road corridors. And so they say, they control cheatgrass in particular pretty aggressively um, on the roadsides, you know, doing every other year or sometimes an annual something like plateau application. Yeah. So with all the road construction and site construction and estimating, have you noticed in the red studies on the water table or off the green grain by the use of water or not making its impact? You mean stock water? Just yeah, stock water. Yeah, yeah not here. Uh, the yeah, the rancher has some. He had been grazing this since before this project, and and knew some of the old timers that grazed it before him. And in this particular location, there seems to be a, a basalt layer where all the water is perched on top of that basalt layer, uh, because every place where there's water, it's all at the same elevation. And but it's been pretty consistent. And and where there is a a, a delay, uh, the Russ Stingley, the older guy there who was in the video, he said there seems to be about a three year delay between when we have a good snow year and when you see a good water year in these seeps. Uh, so, you know, vice versa, if we have a couple of really dry winters, about three years after you have a really dry winter, all of those seeps dry up. And those are the years that they have to haul, you know, when they're running a truck up there to, to haul stock water to these tanks. Uh, but the, yeah, I'm not aware of any studies looking at. The groundwater you know it's, it's still in any given pasture the animals are not there for more than about 30 days and even even in the middle of summer where a cow might be drinking 20 gallons you know per head per day it's still a relatively small amount of water for a short period of time compared to what's in there do you have any problem with the cattle rubbing on those turbines they get around the paths no, they don't. I mean, I don't think I have any photographs of the base, but you know, the base is a concrete pad and then they've got, you know, some big bolts that are about three inches across. Uh, but the bolts aren't tall enough for it to be an attractant for cows to rub on them. And so the, the cows will sit on the, the rocked gravel pad, but they, they don't mess with the turbines. I mean, the towers. And the, if they've had any trouble, it's probably more with elk uh, sitting on those turbine pads and, and sometimes you know, having some patterns that result in rolling rocks away and sometimes they have to kind of rebuild the edges of the pad. Yeah, they get a lot of pressure from elk and they never leave. So, you know, the cows are only there for 30 days, but the elk are there uh, nearly year round, at least on the lower elevations. In the video, there was mention of habitat improvements. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, the Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, has some of the land that has turbines on it and they were involved quite a bit. Now, this is prime sage grouse habitat. In fact, you know, this area is some of the highest quality intact shrub steppe uh, in Washington state. And even though there are no sage grouse there, it's still <coughs> sage grouse habitat. And uh, they did they did some, some spring uh, replanting work in places that have been pretty heavily used in the past. And then they, uh, they also had put these markers on all of the barbed wire fence lines. They use the Master Hunter programs, volunteer labor to put out. So most of the habitat uh, work was uh, replanting stuff around some of the old springs and trying to mark the fences so that they would reduce the potential for a sage grouse running into it uh, if they happen to find it. There's been, I think, two sage grouse sightings in the last 15 years, but no evidence that any of them nested and stayed. Yeah, I'm not sure where that's going to go. If sage grouse are no more intelligent than forest grouse, I don't have a lot of hope for them. But 
you know, we've definitely got the habitat. So uh, if if they were around, they could survive. Okay, we might have some time for questions at the end. Uh, this is this is a quick comment about lease agreements. You know, if you're entering into an agreement with a power company for a wind turbine, there's going to be a lease agreement. Uh, but this is maybe a placeholder just to give some advice on use a written lease agreement on any situation where you're leasing pasture. Uh, the rancher, Russ Stingley here, actually uh, lost, well, Department of Fish and Wildlife lost a lawsuit against Western Watersheds Project because they did not have a written lease agreement in place prior to the initiation of this CRM project. And so the judge had said they were only exempt from SEPA, which is the state version of NEPA, if there had been a, a, a grazing lease in the five years prior to the land changing hands. And uh, they, you know, they could produce, um, you know, payments that had been given to the private landowner by the Stingleys showing that they had been there and had been using the land and leasing it. But the, because there was no written lease agreement, the judge decided that there had not been a grazing lease there. Uh, and therefore SEPA was required and Fish and Wildlife lost that lawsuit. Uh, so sort of in the same way that Good fences make good neighbors, written leases make good neighbors and can avoid what should otherwise be a good relationship going really bad. I wanna just cover a couple of things on grazing management and grazing for fire control before we run out of time. Uh, there's some bad rules of thumb that have not served very well in the semi-arid west with bunch grasses. Some people may have heard the adage that, that the grass plant's goal in life is to produce a seed head and the cowman's goal is to prevent it from doing that. That's a good rule of thumb if we're working with irrigated pastures and sod forming grass species, but it does not work on bunch grasses. And so, you know, if, if we graze rangelands like this photograph, you know, go out in April when you're tired of feeding hay and the cows don't want to be at home anymore and and the plant stays like that for the duration of their short growing season, it will kill the bunch grasses and, and has killed um, bunch grasses on millions of acres across the West. So we want to avoid that. And I think it's helpful just to think through, uh, you know, what this downward successional sequence looks like in order to try to avoid it. You know, the first thing that has happened, which makes some sense from an animal husbandry perspective, is that we're, you know, we're trying to match up uh, the peak of cow nutritional demand with the peak of forage supply and forage quality on, on rangelands. And uh, that results in these plants being grazed you know, during their period of time that they're experiencing rapid growth uh, and need that rapid growth to produce a seed head because most of the native bunch grasses rely on seed production for reproduction. They, they don't primarily reproduce vegetatively. And so when they get grazed during the peak of growth uh, and they're grazed pretty close, uh, it results in them not producing seed and it results in the, the soil not having enough canopy coverage or uh, litter cover. And if that happens, you know, for the entire growing season, which again, you know, tends to be from somewhere in March through about the end of June. Uh, if that happens every year and the animals are there for long enough that they're grazing the regrowth on stuff that's already been bitten once, you end up putting a lot of selection pressure against what need to be the, you know, the, the dominant plants in the plant community. And it puts the grasses at a pretty significant disadvantage. It's sort of like if you went into your garden and you uh, clipped off all the tomatoes at about six inches and left all the lambs quarters and pigweed. And then you come back out in two weeks and do that again. Uh, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what your garden's gonna look like at the end of the growing season. Uh, we want to avoid doing that. Well, if we follow this long enough, we end up with no new plants because they're never going to seed. And we have this upside down age class distribution where we only have old plants and a, a fair bit of bare space that something else is going to, to fill in. Uh, and you know, over time we can end up with a, a near complete conversion to whatever it might be, but pretty commonly it's sagebrush and cheatgrass. Uh, and that's not 
Uh, that's not as productive as what was there before, even though cheatgrass is palatable for a while, and it would be better to avoid that conversion. But once you get there, it's, you know, we're now in a degraded state, but it's also stable. And I think one of the big um, misconceptions, particularly in the conservation community in the last hundred years, has been the idea that if we just remove the cows from the situation, that it's going to automatically return to some pre-Columbus ecological nirvana on its own. And, you know, we now know that that's not going to happen. And it is likely that the same thing that caused the problem may be useful in fixing the problem. You know, so the question is, how, how do we do that? I mentioned that one of the main problems with wind farms is we, you can get a fair bit of site disturbance with road networks. And so we, uh, we want to think through how do we graze and how do we mitigate for some of that disturbance. Uh, and really, the, the answer is still to maintain perennial grasses. They grow for longer in the growing season. They tend to produce more, and they're more effective at stabilizing the soil and competing against cheat grasses. In places where you've got kind of a side-by-side -side, uh, situation with either an area that burned and now you've got cheat grass that is occupying it, you can see that there's significantly less cheat grass density in the places that are occupied by perennial bunch grasses. Uh, they really do work pretty well. And I think we have you know, pretty similar uh, vegetation goals in terms of what we're trying to accomplish, either to reduce the possibility of fire uh, or you know, to uh, respond to fire and try to get site recovery. And, you know, whatever we do, it's, it still has to, whatever we do that might target invasive annual grasses, it still has to encourage perennial species. So we need seed production and we want to discourage the stuff that doesn't need to be there. And I think those are achievable goals. Uh, we have pretty much the same goals after, uh, after fire with the addition that in many cases, we also want to try to graze in a way that we're gonna generate some litter cover and litter to soil contact uh, to help cover up some of this bare soil in the aftermath of a fire, which oftentimes may be swept pretty clean by either wind or water erosion. Uh, so I think I may have time to run through a few useful rules of thumb. You know, this is what we ought to be doing instead of what we ought not to do. Uh, we don't have time to talk about the ins and outs of stocking rate, but, but I still think that there's an application for observing what I'm calling a light stocking rate. Uh, and I would argue that it, having a light stocking rate can cover over a multitude of sins uh, in, in several different ways. And by a light stocking rate, I mean that we're, we're calculating a smaller percentage of the annual total biomass production to be available to livestock uh, in a given year. So it's going to feel like there's not a lot being removed, but that has some significant benefits to the animals uh, and to the land. The second obvious thing that nearly always produces positive results is shortening the grazing period. This may mean, you know, increasing the number of pastures. And in, you know, in this case, we're doing about 30 day, uh, 30 day grazing periods, but those are not on small pastures. Those are, you know, anywhere from about 1500 acres to about 5,000 acres. Um, you know, so we're not talking short duration, high density here, but 30 days is a lot shorter than six months. And being on the same space for six months tends to not work very well. Uh, we don't have time to spend any time on this. I just wanted to illustrate that uh, the, the grazing periods here tend to be between two weeks and in some cases about five weeks. Uh, and that has worked out uh, very well. The third thing is that because these, the dominant plants responsible for site stabilization have to produce seed periodically to reproduce. Uh, it works out really well to graze after seed shatter every once in a while. Not only does that allow full seed production for that year, but it also overcomes one of the barriers to seedling recruitment, which is seed to soil contact. Uh, and, and we have experienced really positive results from grazing after seed shatter about one year and three on all of these pastures. You know, and this seems like it ought to be obvious, but in many cases, it doesn't happen. In order to have anything to harvest, you've got to let it grow first. And so the if the growing season is only about 100 days or 120 days, some of that time 
the plants need to not be exposed to a grazing animal in order for there to be uh, anything to eat. And you know, one of the things that's accomplished by both shorter grazing periods and a relatively light stocking rate is you end up with fairly uh, light per plant defoliation. And uh, that accomplishes several things. One is that you're not removing the entire thing where it's not being grazed down to the stubs. Uh, the other is that animals don't usually eat all the seed heads. Uh, even, even if it's being grazed during that bolting period, uh, the animals are not consuming all the seed head because the cow will come along and, you know, take maybe a third of a plant and graze the tops off and then move on. And if they don't have time to come back to that spot, that plant doesn't get grazed again. Uh, and that also tends to have really positive results. And the last thing is a little bit of distribution effort goes a long way. You know, if you had 20 range scientists in the room, they would all say that very seldom do we have a stocking rate problem, but most places we do have distribution problems. You can have five cows on 10,000 acres and get places that are overgrazed. So a little bit of effort uh, really makes a, a big difference. Uh, I'm going to blow through this real quick. Couple thoughts on grazing for fire control, because I think this is one of the things that you can offer to a landowner that maybe wasn't previously predisposed to think livestock grazing is a good idea. Uh, I think the jury is not out on this anymore and that we have enough research uh, to suggest some solid principles for grazing for limiting fire risk. I think the goal shouldn't be to prevent fire because uh, you know if you look at fire history across these are all the fires in southern Idaho in the last 20 years. I mean, these are the fires in Washington state in the last 20 years. It's going to burn. But the question is, you know, can we limit the amount of damage or burn 500 acres instead of five counties as a result of doing some smart grazing? I think that is possible. And I think we know enough now to make it happen. Uh, you know, just thinking in terms of what actually is the result of even light grazing. Uh, one, you were reducing fine fuel amounts, and, and that makes a difference, even if it's not a lot of it. Uh, but the other thing that's probably a bigger factor is that a little bit of grazing is disrupting the continuity of that fine fuel, so that even when it does burn, you've got larger unburned islands in the middle of a fire, uh, and it also significantly increases fuel moisture levels. And we'll end here in a second on a, some research from Oregon showing a uh, pretty dramatic difference in fuel moisture levels with winter grazing. And of course, you know, with light grazing where you've got patches that are grazed and patches that are not grazed, you're adjusting the spatial distribution of fine fuels in ways that affect fire behavior. Uh, and interestingly, th some of the research from the Soda Fire in Southern Idaho over in the Owyhees uh, from a few years ago showed that bunch grass plant density was a pretty significant factor in competing with cheatgrass. So if you have uh, the choice or the, a situation with large, older bunch grasses versus many smaller bunch grasses, the many smaller bunch grasses were much more effective in keeping cheatgrass out uh, than the big ones. And of course, in places where you haven't had any fire or grazing for quite a while, you can end up with some pretty big, ugly, wolfy plants that nothing wants to eat, including the elk, which is why the elk tend to follow where the cows have been. Uh, and a lot of bare space where there probably shouldn't be quite so much bare ground. The effects of, of that direct manipulation of the plant soil interface and plant uh, and vegetation characteristics uh, tends to influence the rate at which fire is moving along the ground, the height of the flame and the aerial extent of the fire and the, the completeness of the burn inside of the fire footprint. I don't think we have time to talk about cheatgrass grazing, but uh, if anybody's interested, come talk to me. This was the slide I wanted to show because these are pretty dramatic results in the world of range research. Uh, the, the burn station over there in Oregon has done a lot of research on fire, the relationship with grazing, and specifically they were looking at winter grazing and whether or not that affects fuel moisture levels in the middle of summer. So these are fuel moisture levels in July, August, and September. Uh, with a completely ungrazed site and then a winter grazed site where there's no grazing in the in the spring and summer. And the results are, are quite dramatic. Like this is not attempting to overemphasize the difference by manipulating the scale bar. Uh, 
the scale bar is big. So you can see, if you can't quite see the numbers, uh, the ungrazed area has starts the summer with 20% fuel moisture, which is low enough to burn, and it continues on down. Uh, the winter grazed site on the 1st of July has 75% fuel moisture, and then it, it, it's still above 30% in the middle of August. Uh, that's a dramatic difference and has uh, a huge impact on the burnability of a site like that. This happens to be a side-by-side -side, uh, electric fence line where we're doing some winter grazing on a site in Southern Washington. Uh, it has had, the main objective here was to try to get wildflowers to come back instead of this monoculture of blue bunch wheatgrass, but you can see some of that difference there. All right, last couple slides. I can't tell you how many ranchers have told me uh, in a new grazing area, you should have seen what this looked like 15 years ago. And they always mean that it looks better now than it did then. But of course, nobody's got any data to back that up. So anytime you're changing management or moving into a new grazing area, do something, anything to you know take a photograph or something on a fence corner or with a permanent marker or something to document what it looks like. And one of the things that I've found with monitoring is that you often can't predict what's going to change, which is one of the reasons why I think photographs are useful. There could be all kinds of plant community attributes that, that may change in response to a change in management, uh, but you don't know until you try to uh, measure some of it. And one of the more useful apps that's around for this, and there's a couple podcast episodes with Jeff Herrick about this system, is Land PKS. Uh, look it up, download it, and try it out. Uh, I switched over to using LAN PKS because I was getting statistically viable data in about a fifth of the time as I was getting stretching out tapes and running transects and dropping pins. And I've been extremely happy with LAN PKS. Uh, it, it really works well and is getting better all the time. If you don't know plants, uh, there's a couple apps that are really useful. I thought I knew plants, but then you know, you find in the moment that you don't know what it is. So Washington wallflowers includes a lot of plants that would be common across Oregon and, and Idaho. And, um, you know, you select the characteristics that you know, and then it'll spit out a list of plants. Uh, I guess this one is, I'm not sure which one you're seeing. There's, there's one called Montana grasses and one called Washington wallflowers. And they both do a really good job of, of plant ID. I'm not sure why I'd stretch that out. Oh, there it is. All right, I think I'm done. Again, if you haven't looked it up, uh, pull up the Art of Range on whatever podcasting app you use, or you can go to the website. Uh, there's full transcripts there, which we pay quite a bit for. So make use of the transcripts. Uh, and again, if you have suggestions, let me know. But pull it up. I've got some stickers over there. Take a bookmark. And we probably don't have time for questions, but I'm going to be around.